Okay. Yeah, who is this? Hello. Oh, wow. I thought it was going to be Black Hill Roserite attacking me. <laughs> okay, hello? Hi. Are you sure you're not a plant sent by them to attack me? No, I'm not. I just actually have some questions about Christianity. Are you sure you're not Delilah? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, right. You have questions about Christianity. Come on. You know I'm not born yesterday, right? I was born the day before. You even have okay. an Islamic name. It sounds like an Islam. Are you a Muslim? Muslima? Yes, I am. So why don't you just tell me you're Muslim? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. All right, what's your question? But Jay, before you ask me, you have your Bible and Quran ready. Um, no, but I just would like to hear your point La of view. All right, let's see. Go ahead. Okay, first I would like to ask you, since you're an Assyrian, do uh -oh. you follow the Orthodox faith of Christianity? What, I don't know what you mean, if I'm Assyrian Orthodox, what do you mean? Because usually Assyrians follow the Church of the East, so exactly. I was just wondering that's if the that's church what you of my, follow. Yep, that's my, the Church of my ancestors, my parents, and uh -huh. that's my church, yes. What about it? So I was just wondering if that is the correct form of Christianity. Uh, you're, you're asking too difficult of a question. I can't say it's the correct form without implying the others are wrong. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't answer it in that terms. I would say the Assyrian Church of the East, the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Coptic Church, are all true churches established by the Lord Jesus Christ. They have differences, but those differences do not mean they're not true churches that God is working through for his glory, and they're cut off from the spiritual body of Christ. That's how I like to answer. It's similar to Islam. Just like this in Christianity, Islam, Judaism, you have varieties of expressions, right? I don't know if you're Sunni. Are you a Sunni? Yes. Are you Salafi? I wouldn't consider myself one. So, are you Ashari, Maturidi? No, just Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. But the Ashari and the Maturidi will say they're Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And so mm -hmm. will the Salafi say that, that they follow the, the Salaf Salih. But they believe Allah has eyes, He has two right hands, He has a shin, He's above the throne, the Arsh, the Kursi. Do you believe Allah mm -hmm. has hands that are literal hands, unlike anything in creation? Well, actually, since um, my family is not very religious, and my culture is not very religious as well, actually, I'm Albanian, and they're mostly secular people, so I would say Muslim by culture. But you have Sheikh Al Albani, who was considered yes. one of the greatest Muslim scholars of the 20th century, and he was uh -huh. Albanian, Sheikh Al Albani. But anyway, may God continue to guide you on your journey. So, okay, that was the first question. What's your second question? Um. I'm just kind of a bit confused because a lot of Christians say that people are in heaven and hell currently, but then they also talk about judgment day. Yes. So if there is judgment day, then how come somebody's in heaven or hell well, currently? Let me let me give you an example from your background so you understand. Okay, you believe in the Barzakh, that when people die, like your prophet, they're in the grave and they're shown their place in heaven and they're shown their place in hell, right? If they're unbelievers, they're shown their place in heaven. Believers, they're shown their place in uh, I'm sorry, if they're unbelievers, they're placed in, they'll see their place in hell. If they're believers, they'll, sh they'll be shown their place in heaven, right? <clears throat> okay. Okay. So when a person dies, you make a distinction between their souls and their bodies. Their souls can be, for example, in Christian faith, if they're believers with God in heaven or in this place of torment, but then their bodies are raised. When their bodies are raised, then their souls are united to their bodies. And then in their bodies, they'll either continue to live with God or live apart from God under his wrath. So there's, is there anybody in heaven or hell currently? Of course. Everyone who's a believer who dies in Jesus Christ is alive in Jesus' heavenly presence as souls. Their bodies have disintegrated. If they're unbelievers, their souls went to the place of torment. So then what happens at the day of judgment? Their From bodies are raised. And when their okay. bodies are raised, what happens to their souls? Their souls are united to their bodies. And then if they're believers, they will reign with Jesus on earth. If they're unbelievers, 
They'll be thrown into everlasting destruction, body and soul together. Okay, and um, I kind of have another question that's mm -hmm. it's not so much about the faith itself, mm -hmm. but I just noticed that a lot of um, people who talk against Islam, they say about poly polygyny, yes. and they say that it's wrong, mm -hmm. but it's also in Christianity. Where? So I was just wondering Christianity where? how yes. Abraham had two wives or Moses. Oh, easy. You... As a Muslim, you believe that as the prophets came, they abrogated previous commands of previous legislations, right? Nasikh wa mansur, you believe that. So why are you going to the Old Testament period where God allowed a lot of things that Jesus did away with? Why? How come you got stuck with Abraham? Jesus doesn't exist in your book? Well, a lot of Christians in Africa, for example, they practice it. And... Even like Mormons and so stuff. So ISIS, they, ISIS, do you consider them Muslim? They say they're Muslim. So why are you going by what Christians do? Why not go by what their source teaches? Because I say ISIS is true. So I'm saying, no, it's not. They're not Muslim, but they claim to be Muslim. See, why Why would we do that? I just said go so to Jesus. Where in the New Testament does it condemn religion what? and say you? First Corinthians 7 verses 1 to 5. Okay, so are you ready now to just is... marry one Christian man and give up on your deen? 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. Let's post it so you can see. Here, I'll show it to you. I'm just waiting for it to come up. Now, concerning the things of which you write to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. In other words, to be celibate, if he can handle it. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Now, before I proceed, now you see it says each woman has her own husband, right? Not husbands? Yes. How many husbands can she have? One. Oh, but let's finish it. Let each man have his own wife, not wives. How many wives can a husband have? It's saying there one. Okay. Now let's continue reading. It's three to five. Let's continue reading now. Okay. <clears throat> Let the husband render to his wife, not wives, the affection due to her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband, not husbands. Now watch this, because you're not going to find this teaching in the Quran. And I'll ask you to show me if it is in the Quran. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. So her body belongs to her husband. Now watch this. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So the husband's body belongs to the wife. The wife's body belongs to the husband. One husband, one wife. Do not deprive one another. In other words, do not deny each other sexual intimacy unless you agree. You both agree for a period of time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So just like the woman has one husband, the man has one wife, and the man's body belongs to his wife. His wife's body belongs to him. So when the wife wants to be intimate, the man can't say no. Now, can you show me a similar teaching in the Quran? Where the Quran says that the husband's body belongs to the woman and the husband's body is the woman's still? I don't know about the husband's body, but I, I know some hadith that says how the woman is like a garden or a field for no, the husband. No, that's in the Quran. And, that's in Surah yeah. Al-Baqarah, chapter 2 of the Quran. If you go to chapter 2, verses 223. Chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 223. It says that your wives are your field. Plow into them the way you want. Do you like that? Do you like Allah describing you as a field that your husband can plow into? Um, can we move to the next question? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I know that in um, Christianity, a lot of there's some people that say that God is one, and then they say that is also one. Jesus is man and God in one. Yes. But in the Old Testament, and it talks about God being like the creator of the world, but yeah. it doesn't mention himself being Jesus. So I'm just wondering yeah, how when you say Jesus, it kind of changed. Yeah, why would you expect like, the name Jesus to be given in the Old Testament when Jesus is the name given when he became man? Why would I expect Jesus, the name, to appear in the Old mm -hmm. Testament when that's the name given to him when he became man? So if you're asking me, does the Old Testament show the one God is more than one person? All over the place. I just gave an example to one man earlier, but I can do it again. But even when you say God is one, that needs explaining. And I want you to think logically, and not just logically, because God gave you a mind, aql and naql. You have aql, your reasoning, you have naql revelation. All right. Obviously, you agree with me, God is beyond understanding. We can't fully comprehend, understand God, right? 
Yes. So Akal, logic will only take you so far. Nakal will take you the rest of the way. And there are things that are aql, our logic cannot comprehend because God is beyond comprehension. We all agree with that. Muslim, Christian. Now, with that said, when you say God is one, what does it mean for him to be one? See, to say one meaning, means nothing if you don't define it. What's one? Meaning one and like there's nothing else like him and okay. nothing well, over him. There's just... Okay, well, you know, there's unique. nothing like the Trinity, right? Can you show me in creation a triune being? One being that's three persons simultaneously. Is there anything in creation like that? Well, a lot of Christians use example like you're a human body and then your soul. And that's not three persons, like three one being. One. That's not three persons, one being. I'm mm -hmm. saying three persons, three persons that exist as one being. Their being is one. Their existence is one, but they are three persons in relationship. Anything in creation like that? No, I've never heard anything like that. So you just proved the Trinity is unlike anything in creation. So the Trinity is more likely to be true because God is unlike anything in creation. Okay, if you put it that way, I can see that, but I don't know. It's just... Well, you have your own Trinity, mm -hmm. so you're confusing me because you say you believe Ahl al-Sunnah wa jama The Quran is Kalam Allah, speech of Allah. It's the speech of Allah, the word of Allah, kalam Allah. You're not a Shia, you're not a Mutazila. You don't believe the Quran is created because according to Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama, that would be kufr, that would be disbelief, right? Um, is, is disbelief to think that the Quran is incomplete or... No, it's missing. disbelief to say it's created because the Quran is kalam Allah, the speech of Allah. It's one of his sifat. sifat. Okay. Okay, so don't take my word for it. Go online, search Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama, or go ask your sheikh if he's knowledgeable. Sheikh, is the Quran kalam Allah? Yes. Is it uncreated or is it created? Makhluk will say it's uncreated. To say it's created is kufr. Okay. So with that said, let's assume you agree because you have to agree because you said you're Ahl al-Sunnah. And go and confirm it. After I'm done speaking with you, find a knowledgeable Muslim. If you, You're not Shia. So Shia will say it's makhluk, it's created. Because they follow the Mutazila. You are Sunni, you are Ahl al-Sunnah. Ask someone who knows Ahl al-Sunnah theology, Quran created or is it Kalam Allah? They'll say, no, it's not created, it's uncreated, it's eternal because it's a speech of Allah. So with that said, the Quran is not Allah, right? No. Okay, now follow with me because I'm going to show you you have the same problem. The difference is my problem is true because I have the true God and his true word. You think you have the true God. May God keep guiding you. Okay, the Quran is not Allah. So now Allah is uncreated and the Quran is uncreated. Allah is uncreated and the Quran is uncreated according to Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Let's do the math. Allah is uncreated. The Quran is uncreated. The Quran is not Allah. That's two. You have two uncreated things. How is that possible? Well, they say that uh, the Quran was um, made by Allah and then it's stuck it was... For Allah. If you're Ahl al-Sunnah, that is kufr. It's not made by Allah. It's always been. It's uncreated. I mean, I have the quotations from the scholars. I have Hamza Yusuf okay. in his translation of, you know, the Aqidah of Tahawi, the creed of At-Tahawi, at showing this is the position. I have the citations. I can show it to you. But this is the position of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jamaat. So confirm it, please. I don't want you to take my word for it. They will tell you it's uncreated. So then you ask them the question. Allah is uncreated. Quran is uncreated. Quran is not Allah. That's two. How do you have two uncreated things? Then they'll tell you, ah, oh. they'll say, Bilakayf. I have that hard time pronouncing the ka. Anyway, Bilakayf meaning, even though we don't understand how, Allah says it, for Allah it makes sense, and that's good enough for us. And they'll say, though the Quran is not Allah, it's not other than Allah, because it's a part of Him. So that means you have a mystery in your own deen that you don't comprehend, but you don't deny. The difference between you and me, you say Quran is the speech of Allah. I say Jesus is the speech of Allah. And Allah's speech became, God's speech became a man, not a book. So if you can still believe Allahu Ahad, Allah Wahid, God is one, Allah is one, though the Quran is uncreated, and it's not Allah, but not other than Him, and it's still one, 
then why do you have a problem with me saying God's eternal word became a man, his name is Jesus, and God is still one? Why do you have a problem with that? I don't have a problem. I was Good. just asking. Good. No, and I say that, that Jen, I'm, not, I'm saying it in a nice way. I'm not saying it in a mean way. Problem meaning because okay. say, oh, it doesn't make sense. Well, there are things about God that's not going to make sense to anyone. That doesn't mean we reject it. Okay, and the last thing, because I don't want to take too much time. You can take all the time is, you want. Um, is um, in, in Islam, it says that the, um, I don't know how much you know about this, about the crucifixion being, it was appeared to the people. Yes, Surah Tanisa, Ayah 147. So why, why would a crucifixion be a, an illusion to somebody? That's What's exactly the point, point of that? I agree with you. you got to ask the Muslims, why would Allah... Make it appear unto the Jews that Jesus was killed if Jesus was never killed. And then why would all... And there's two them? versions of it as well. They said he was a man who looked like him. Or that they say somebody else took his place. Okay. And they suspected to be the one who turned against him, like Judas. Sure. So there's two versions to that, yeah. if you know about it. No, I don't know about it. They say one of the disciples was made to look like him. Or it mm -hmm. was the betrayer Judas or someone else who was made to look like him. But either way, who made the person look like it was Jesus? They said Allah, and then it said also Allah is the best of uh, deceivers. deceivers you're right, you're right, you're but right. I'm just wondering, but what was the point to deceive somebody to become a Christian when the message is Islam? Well, it never happened. That's what I'm saying. The Quran doesn't know what it's talking That's why we're not Muslim. Because the followers of Jesus and all the earliest documents and Prove me wrong. Quote a serious, not a joke, conspiratory, conspiratory theorist who doesn't believe Jesus existed. Quote any serious historian, even someone like Bart Ehrman who's not a Christian, any serious historian, and get them to say Jesus was not killed by crucifixion. They all agree on this. The one fact they agree. They'll deny Jesus is God. They'll deny that he claimed to be God. They'll deny much of the New Testament. But they'll say one fact we know, Jesus was killed by crucifixion. And they'll say another fact we know, his disciples, those who knew him, like Peter and Mary Magdalene, went around preaching that he was killed by crucifixion and God raised him from the dead. So according to Islam, that means Allah convinced the Hawariyun, the disciples of Jesus, Jesus was killed for their sins and God raised them to vindicate him. Why did Allah do this? Allahu Alam, they'll tell you. No, because Allah didn't do anything. Jesus was killed and he was raised from the dead because he voluntarily died for my sins and now is risen as Lord of creation. And if I trust in him, I will be saved. In fact, according to you, Ahlul Sunnah, where is Isa? Alayhi salam. That's what you guys say. Where is he now? They say that he it says he wasn't killed nor and so where crucified, he? but he was raised up to heaven. Well, you know what the sad thing is? It doesn't say heaven. They're deceiving you. I'm going to give you two ayat from the Quran. Two ayat from the Quran. Surat al-Imran, Surat al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 55, and I'll read it for you if you want. And Surat al-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 158. So you write them down. Surat al-Imran, the chapter of the family of Imran, chapter 3, verse 55, and Surat al-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 158. You want me to read them for you? Okay. Okay, it says, When God said, when Allah said, oh, Jesus, indeed, I will take you and raise you to myself, raise you to myself and purify you from those who disbelieve. Now, 4158, it says, nay, but Allah raised him to himself. The Quran doesn't say Jesus was taken to heaven. The Quran says Allah raised Jesus, took Jesus to himself. Where's Allah. They said in, in his throne. Okay, where's Jesus if Allah took Jesus to himself? Well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> well, the Quran says it. Here, let me read it. Okay. Nay, Surah Nisa 4158. Nay, Allah took him up to himself. Jesus was taken to Allah. Wherever Allah is, that's where Jesus went. So if Allah is on the throne and Allah took Jesus to himself, where is Jesus, according to the Quran? I don't want to say anything it's that okay. I don't know. I know. No, I know you're scared. May Jesus set you free from your fear. 
because Jesus does not give you a spirit of fear. It says he gives you a spirit, a spirit of boldness and of love, not a spirit of fear and timidity. So may Jesus, the true son of God, save you because he's in love with you. Now, if I just go by the Quran, I'm going to repeat it again, 4158. And if you have the Quran open and read it, it's right there. Surah Tanisa, chapter 4, verse 158. It says, Nay, Allah took him to himself. The Quran says Allah took Jesus to where Allah is. That means if Allah is on the throne, Jesus is on the throne, and he's been there for 2,000 years. What in the world is Jesus doing with Allah on the throne for 2,000 years when even Muhammad is dead and buried in the tomb? I don't know. Exactly. You won't know. You know why you won't know? Why? Because you're following the false religion. If you come to the truth, you will know. In fact, I'm going to give you some more questions. I'm not debating you. And if you don't have an answer, it's okay. I want you to think about it. You know okay. the only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran is Mary, the mother of Christ, right, Maryam? Yes. And you know that in Surah, uh, Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 42, it says that Mary, Maryam, is the greatest woman, that Allah preferred her and purified her and chose her above all women, right? Yes. And you know, according to Said Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, it says, according to your prophet, this is the tafsir, the exposition, the interpretation of chapter 3, verse 36, where Mary's mother prayed to Allah, and he goes, I entrust her and her offspring. I entrust Mary, my daughter, and her offspring to you to be protected from the accursed Satan. And then Sa'id Bukhari, Sa'id Bukhari and Sahih Muslim state that your prophet says that Satan touches, pricks, all the children of Adam when they're born, except Mary yeah. and her son. Yeah. You know that, right? Yeah. Okay, so now follow me. Mary and Jesus are the only human beings Satan could not touch, but that means he touched your prophet. Mary and Jesus are the only human beings in the Quran said to be pure and sinless. Mary is the only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran. Not even your prophet's mother or his wives or the wives of anyone or the mothers of anyone are mentioned. Mary is the best woman Allah made. Mary has an entire chapter named in her honor. So my question to you, why is Mary so honored? Pure, like her son is pure. The only woman mentioned by name has an entire chapter named in her honor. The greatest woman Allah created. What makes her so special? If Muhammad is the best, how come his mother is not mentioned? She's not the best. She's not preferred. And according to Sai Muslim, she's in hell. Who is in hell? His mother? Yes, that's in Sai oh, Muslim. Yes. yes, I read something that, uh, there's some narration that the Prophet cried for his yes, mother. Yes, Sai Muslim. Yeah. I have it in my articles. Okay. Sai Muslim. And it well, says also, in Sai Muslim. If you look at uh, Noah, or New in Arabic, his uh, wife and his son were disbelievers. Good, because they're not as so, great as Jesus. So what, what makes Mary great? You're making my point. What, what, what makes Mary great? Well, the, the same thing about her being pure is like um, how, how Jesus was created without a father. But then somebody could say Adam was created without Good. a father. So what would make him great? Okay, now let me show you why that's a silly argument. Was Adam the first man? Yes. Could he have parents? No. Was Eve the first woman? Yes. Could she have a mother? No, her father. So why was Jesus born of a virgin when it wasn't necessary? He could have been born to human parents. So why was he born of a virgin then? I don't know, but I guess exactly. for... Um, you don't know, right? Like a, uh, it's like um, there's different prophets for different reasons, so... None of them That's just... have the qualities of Jesus. None of them. Show me in the Quran where someone other than Jesus is said to be pure and his mother pure. Show me that. Show me in the Quran where someone besides Jesus was born of a virgin. Adam and Eve, bad argument because Adam could not have parents. He's the first man. Eve, first woman. She couldn't mm -hmm. have a mother. But for Jesus, he could have been born the natural way like your prophet was born the natural way, like, like Abraham. But for some mm -hmm. reason... God decides to cause Jesus to be born miraculously, and yet you Muslims don't know why. And then on top of that, the Quran and Hadith call Jesus Karimat Allah, Ruh Allah, the word of Allah and the spirit of Allah. 
And it says well, it's also the th it's called the um, the Rasul, the one who comes. And Rasul is common to everyone, right? Book. Everyone, Abraham is a Rasul, and Moses is a Rasul, right? No, I yes, they are. I'm pretty sure that the Rasul is the one who came with the book, like Moses with the Torah, the Injil, the Bible, Jesus, and then the third book. Okay, in Surah An Nisa, chapter four, verse one sixty three, one sixty four. A list of names of given and they're said to be Rasul, meaning apostles. So what I'm trying to say is this term Rasul, is it only no, no, one no, person? The Nabi. I think Nabi is the Not one. in Surah An Nisa, it doesn't say Nabi. I know your argument. There it doesn't say Nabi. It says Rasul, Rasul. They were given okay. Wahi and but their I, name. I wasn't sure because I don't speak Arabic. So I, I didn't okay. know which was Nabi and which is what That's fine. Nabi means prophet and Rasul means messenger. But okay. still, you're, you're missing okay. the point. Is there only one prophet or are there many people called prophets? There are many prophets, many messengers. Okay, now can you show me someone besides Jesus called the word of Allah? I don't know. There is none. Can you show me someone besides Jesus called Ruh Allah? But if you say that the Quran is false, then why would it prove Christianity? Because you believe it. I don't need to quote the Quran, but you believe the Quran, right? Okay. Yes. So if I show you what your Quran tells you to believe, why are you rejecting it? If you're not a Muslim, because we're not going to quote the Quran. No, because you're trying to show me that, um, you see, Christianity is true because, look, the Quran is making correlations like to Just Christianity. Just like you like, appeal to the Bible see, look, to prove Muhammad is true, right? So why do you Muslims appeal to the Bible to show Muhammad is true? Because they say that uh, actually he was predicted in the Bible. Ah, but then the corrupt Bible. That it wasn't. Oh, so the corrupt Bible. So those parts of the Bible show Muhammad is a liar. That's corrupt. So I'm doing to you what needs to be done because you believe in the Quran. I don't. I'm telling you, your Quran tells you all these things about Jesus. Do you have an answer? No. So then you come to the truth and you'll have your answer. I don't use the Quran to prove the Bible. The Bible doesn't need the Quran. The Bible condemns the Quran. But you believe the Quran. If you're a Hindu, I'll quote your Vedas for you. I'm not going to quote your Quran. Okay. So again, okay. according to your Quran, what makes Jesus so special that he's the only one called the Word of Allah and the, the Spirit of Allah? And that is mother's well, when I ask other Muslims, they say it's just one of the miracles like of God that he he would create a human being without a father. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So he's called the word of Allah because he was created by Allah, his word? I don't know. I don't yeah, know. They don't know either. Yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to make sense because that still doesn't explain to me of all the people. Jesus is born of a virgin. He's the word of Allah sent to Mary, a spirit from him. He is pure. Mary is the only woman mentioned by name. She's the greatest of all women. She is poor. And all of a sudden, all of that just, it's, it's a coincidence. It's just a coincidence. It's just this one individual. And related to that, can you show me someone other than Jesus and Allah in the Quran that creates from clay and breathes life into that clay and makes it a living being? There is none, but yeah. there were other prophets who performed miracles like Moses. Show me where they created the like Allah. Allah is the only one who creates from play and breathes life into it along with Jesus. See how you're trying to denigrate this miracle that even your Quran doesn't ascribe to him, but Allah and Jesus? That's not going to get you far. Can you show me where someone besides Jesus creates exactly like Allah does? And why is Jesus breathing life? Yeah, the verb is create. It's Kalaka. Well, in the Bible, it says, like, Jesus says, like, um, I can't do anything except with the power of permission sure? of God. So. That's not what he says. You misquoted him. But you sure you want to go to Jesus? Because okay. if I quote that, it's going to prove Jesus is Muhammad's God. You want me to show you that? But I'm just wondering why, um, if, if God came to earth, why he would need the permission of God if he is God. Because if he is not the only person of God, but he's the son of the Father, you want him to dishonor the Father and disrespect him? Is that what you want him to do? I, I wouldn't know if that's disrespect or not because I'm not understanding the... Okay. Jesus is not the Father. So he's the Father's Son who's one with him in nature. So if the Father sends him, what do you want him to do? Say, hey, Dad, you know what? Because I'm God, I'm going to do what I want. I don't need to listen to you. That's what you want him to I'm do? Just, I'm just confused how there could be somebody who is unknowledgeable and then somebody who's all-knowing at the same time. I don't understand what you're asking. Say it again. Like, because... Somebody like Jesus who is um, limited because he needed he needed to ask God for permission and for help. See, and again, you're confusing permission with ability. See, and you're twisting it. Here, do you drive? Yes. Okay. If I give you permission to drive my car, does that mean I'm giving you the ability to drive it? Yeah, I understand what you mean, yeah. Okay. Well, and, uh, let me repeat it again because I said it too mm -hmm. fast. 
I give you permission to drive my car. Does that mean I gave you the ability to drive my car? Or I'm assuming yeah. that you have the ability and I'm permitting you to use your ability. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you're giving me the ability. So now can you show me either in the Bible or in the Quran where it says God gave Jesus the ability as opposed to God permitting Jesus to exercise his divine power and ability? Be, I don't know. It doesn't. Not, because I'll tell you what the Quran says. Be ithni Allah means by the permission of Allah. By the permission of Allah is not huwa or huwa power. Okay. Okay. But and, can I go to that verse that you quoted that you said Jesus had to be given power? I want to read it in context if you don't mind. I'll go back to the Bible. Is this the New Testament? Yes. The one that you mentioned there where Jesus says that okay. I do nothing on my own, right? Yes. Okay, now let's read it carefully. You ready? Yeah. John 5, 19, because that's the one you quoted because Muslims often misquote that. John 5, okay. 19, let's read it. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most surely I say to you, now here's what you were quoting. The son can do nothing of himself, but let's finish it. But what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. So notice what Jesus said. I cannot do anything on my own initiative. I can only do what the Father does, and I do whatever the Father does. Now, I want to ask you a question. Can a creature say, I cannot do anything except what God does, and whatever God does, I do it the same way that God does it? No, because a human being cannot do what God does. But the, Jesus just said exactly what you just mm -hmm. read. Read it again. John five nineteen. See what Jesus said. This is the verse that Muslims always quote out of context. John 5, okay. 19. Let, but let me read one more time because I want it to sink in. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, by himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like manner. So can you quote any angel, Jibreel, or your prophet saying, I cannot do a single thing on my own initiative. I can only do what Allah does, and whatever Allah does, that's what I do. No. So does this sound like a mere man talking or someone who thinks he's God in the flesh, one with the Father? I'm not sure. Um, okay, but, but I would like to. Okay, go ahead. I would like to just move on to the next okay, question. Okay, go ahead. What's the next question? Um, I know that in Islam it says that the only uh, sin that's uh, unforgivable is shirk, yep. which is like associating partner with Allah. Um, and basically, a Muslim could go to hell if they do things like they don't pray their five daily prayers or they miss yeah. Ramadan on purpose and other things, but they will only go to hell for a short time. Um, I was wondering in Christianity if a Christian could still go to hell. Yeah, well, you're asking. That depends on what tradition you follow. There is a tradition among Catholics that believe in purgatory. It's not hell. Purgatory in the Catholic understanding, and you have to ask the Catholic, I'm not an expert in Catholic theology, just like you have different theologies in Islam, right? You can't be an expert in everything. Okay. In Catholic theology, there's purgatory. Purgatory is only for true Christians who love Jesus Christ, but they may have not cooperated with the Holy Spirit to undo the temporal effects of the sins they committed on earth. So now they need to go to a realm in which they are pur purged and purified and cleansed to enter into heaven. So purgatory, if you go to purgatory in Catholic teaching, that means you're going to heaven. Only those who are going to go to heaven go to purgatory. Those who don't go to heaven go to hell and they stay there. But that's a Catholic teaching. You'd have to ask a Catholic to show you why he believes it and the scriptural support for it. Okay, and about the Orthodox Christianity, they have a lot of pictures in the church, sure. lots of uh, statues and things like that. But I thought that was against Christianity because no. it says in the Ten Commandments not no, to make No, the Ten Commandments doesn't image. say no. It doesn't say no pictures. Ten Commandments says you don't make pictures of things that you worship as gods and goddesses. There's a difference. It's a difference between having an image of a god or a goddess that you worship and having an image because the same god commissioned fashion images but beyond that in islam islam stands condemned because in leviticus 26 1 it says you're not going to take any figured stones and venerate them so why does your prophet kiss a black stone smother a black stone and touch a black stone and made it sunnah for you when you go to hajj or umrah that if you can you must touch and kiss the black stone well 
I don't know much about um, Hajj or not. But that is in Hajj. Don't take my word for it. Ask the Muslim. When you perform Hajj or Umrah, one of the rites of Hajj, not only do you run between Safa and Marwa seven times and run around the Kaaba seven times and throw stones at Wadi Mina. If you're able, because of the crowds, you may not be able, you must touch the black stone and kiss it. And there is a hadith in Bukhari what Omar ibn al-Khattab said when he's about to kiss it. He goes, indeed, you are stone, and I know that you can neither harm nor benefit me. Had I not seen the messenger of Allah kiss you, I would not have kissed you. So he didn't understand the logic of it. So according to the Sharia of Musa, Muhammad stands condemned. And if you do that, you stand condemned. Because that is a stone that has no significance. It was a stone venerated by the pagans that Muhammad took over. But coming back to your question, the Bible doesn't say you can't have images. It says you can't have images of things that you worship as gods and goddesses. And I can show you in the Bible where God himself said, make an image. An image that you don't worship as a god or goddess, but an image nonetheless. That's in the Bible. I can show you that if you want to see it. Okay. Um, but... Then, but why didn't some uh, Orthodox like those hymns and stuff they say like uh, Mary, Mother of God, and they kind well, of like praise her? Well, I mean, think about it. If Jesus is God in her womb, he didn't stop being God. In one sense, she's the Mother of God. In that, the baby that's forming in her womb, taking a physical body, is still God in her womb. So technically, even though you don't believe it, I don't, I'm not saying believe it, but technically, if Jesus was God in her womb, technically, isn't that the Mother of God? If you put it that way, yeah. It okay, that's like the it. thing. So the debate is, do you accept that Jesus is God who became a human baby and he took a human nature from the blessed womb of his mother? Well, you reject that. But let's say you believed it. Jesus is the eternal word of the Father. Karimat Allah, like the, the Quran says, or Hadith. And that eternal word entered the womb of Mary and resided in her womb, taking a physical body, human nature, by the power of God to become a human baby. But in that womb, he's still the word, he's still divine, he's still God. So technically, she would, she'd would be the mother of God, right? Like I said, if you put it that way, yes, but I'm not going to... No, that's okay. I'm not saying yeah. believe it, but now you get the logic. So that's why Christians say what they say. They're not saying Mary gave God his life, or Mary gave God his divine nature, or Mary gave birth to a divine person who didn't exist. They're saying that Mary gave to Jesus a physical body, a human nature that he took from her womb, but that Jesus is the eternal word. He's a divine person that existed before Mary and chose Mary to be his mother. That's what we're saying. And um, a lot of Muslims say that actually Jesus was Palestinian, but right. in the Quran it says Bani Israel. Israel. Yeah. yeah, they're just saying that because they want to argue that the land belongs to them. Uh, that's you know okay. neither here nor there. I, you know, but I mean the term Palestine. It wasn't called Palestine at the time of Jesus. It wasn't. There's Judea. also no P in the Arabic. Um, yeah. Well, even they'll say Philistine. It wasn't called Philistine. Mm -hmm. It was called Judea. Uh, and, but uh, you get the point. Okay, and the last thing, um, a lot of Muslims say that it's the true religion because if you were to take all the Qurans and throw them in the garbage or in the ocean, it, the Quran could be brought back because it's memorized. Really? So what if somebody destroyed all the Bibles? How can you bring it back? Did anybody okay, now, memorize the Bible? Then how do you explain the fact that you have at least 38 different Arabic versions of the Quran and even in Islamic tradition, you have seven qirat of the Uthmanic Mus'haf and those seven came down through two chains for a four, for total of 14 pirat plus three others for good measure that was chosen by Mujahid centuries later. So then which of those Arabic versions is the actual original version that Uthman codified? And if memorization preserved the Quran, then explain to me why in Sahel Bukhari, volume six, I'm giving you the English numbering. Sal Bukhari, volume 6, number 510, Uthman ibn Affan ordered the Arabic Masahif, the Arabic Qurans, the copies of the Quran written in Arabic by Muhammad's companions such as Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay, Ubay ibn Kaab be gathered and burned and destroyed because those Arabic Qurans, they disagreed so much with one another. Some Qurans had verses that the other Qurans didn't have. 
if memorization was able to preserve it. Didn't Abdullah ibn Masood memorize the Quran? Didn't Ubay ibn Kaab memorize the Quran? If so, why is it when they wrote down the Quran, their Qurans contradicted each other and didn't completely agree? I don't know about that. I just know yeah, that. Of course they're not going to know. They're not going to tell you. <laughs> exactly. They're not going to tell you. And as far as the Bible is concerned, let me tell you why the Bible can't be destroyed. When the Bible books were written, they were immediately copied and sent to different centers all over the world. So if I wrote a book, the people made copies of it and spread it to other parts of the world. So from early on, the books of the Bible were mass copied and sent all over the world at a time in which you didn't have internet, you didn't have email, you didn't have UPS. So you would make a copy, and by the time, let's say you're in Israel and you go to Rome, it'll take you weeks if not months to get there. And there, you give the copy to the church there, and they start copying it. So what happens is the Bible is mass copied, which is why today, right now, Right now as we speak, we still have in our possession in museums all over the world nearly 25,000 copies of the books of the Bible in different languages. As far as the New Testament, written in Greek, we have about 5,300 copies in Greek. And then we have about 10,000 copies of the biblical books in Latin. And then we have thousands of others in Aramaic, Syriac, Sahidic Coptic, Armenian, and that's what has survived. So imagine throughout the centuries, mass copying of the Bible, different parts of the world, they have their copies that they're copying and recopying and recopying. So at what point in time could the Bible ever be lost? If nobody memorized it. Why would they need to if uh, you still didn't get follow me? Mm -hmm. Paul wrote down Titus. And there are people copying what Paul wrote down and spread it, and they're copying it and recopying it. So at what point in time was it lost? I'm just saying if all of a sudden all the Bibles were just vanished, how would you bring it back? How is that possible when you're giving me a hypothetical? I mean, I can't, I can't deal with hypotheticals because if you destroy all the Bibles, then that means God failed to preserve his word. So you're dealing with hypotheticals. I'm dealing with actual. But it also says that about the Quran that it's it's been it's actually they say the Quran is one of the miracles that it's been preserved. I just told you that the Arabic Qurans because... are not identical. They have thousands of differences in the Arabic alone. Uthman destroyed the copies of Muhammad's companion Sahaba. You know Abdullah bin Masood, right? He's a Sahabi. Okay. I, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, why did Uthman destroy the Arabic Mus'haf of Abdullah bin Masood when Sahih Bukhari? Sai Bukhari, take my word for it, do your research. Muhammad said, learn the Quran from four. And he mentioned Abdullah ibn Masood and Ubay ibn Kab as two. Abdullah ibn Masood and Ubay ibn Kab, their Qurans disagreed. One had verses the other didn't have, and one had more surahs than the other. And Uthman destroyed both their copies, and he standardized the one produced by Zayd. Who gave Uthman that right? Why did they destroy their copies? And why did their copies disagree when they memorized the Quran from Muhammad? Why didn't their memorization agree? I, I don't know about that, honestly. Yeah, uh, I know you don't know because the Muslims are not telling you. They're deceiving you. But can I ask okay, another wait, question? Speaking about deceiving. Okay, before um, you go there, before you go there. Okay. The Quran doesn't say Allah will preserve the Quran. I'll tell you what it says. Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verse 9. It says, we have sent down Al-Dhikr. We have sent down Al-Dhikr, and we will guard it. It says, we sent down the reminder, and we will guard it. Now, the Muslims will tell you that there, the reminder means the Quran. No. If you read the Quran, it's not just the Quran. The dhikr refers to all the books that Allah sent down through his messengers, that he'll preserve all of them. Because the Quran calls the Bible dhikr, reminder. Okay. So do you believe the Quran, that Allah preserved the dhikr, the reminder? I just, I believe the Quran was... No, not, not, re let it. me repeat my question, young sister. Do you believe the Quran when it says Allah will preserve dhikr? Dhikr. That's chapter 15, verse 9, meaning the reminder in English. Reminder or remembrance. Do you believe Allah preserved the dhikr? Like I said, I don't want to say anything. Okay. That, well, read it. Uh -huh. Because the dhikr in the Quran is not just the Quran. It's all of the scriptures, even the Bible. But anyway, what's your next question? Go ahead. 
Okay, about deceiving, a lot of, I actually watched a lot of debates with you and uh, David Wood and others, and they spent, and they mentioned a lot about Muslims using Takiya, like mostly towards converts, like deceiving them about the religion. Saying, just like they deceive um, you about the Quran. Of, like just about the religion in general, like a lot of converts, you know, they come from very, many of them come from troubled up, uh, pass yeah. and um, they've been through a lot and then they say look in Islam the divorced woman she gets you know if you marry a divorcee you get um, high status really? and you know the prophet he married the widow he helped all the women and then when they actually become a Muslim they know that actually just because of their past they're treated very badly mm. so I'm just like wondering why um, why would a Muslim have to trick people to convert to the religion when but if you ask a muslim what is takia they say no it's only if like somebody's going to kill you and, and you say um like i'm not a muslim just to like not to be killed it's not to deceive people so how come like christians they say that that's takia like people lying well yeah because to, they're they're telling you that there's only one situation for takia to protect yourself well they can say, well, this is a form of protection. We are not telling people what Islam truly teaches lest they find out and get angry and persecute Muslims. For example, when's the last time you heard a Muslim come up in a stadium telling people, according to Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24, married women aren't lawful for Muslim men except those that their right hands possess and what that means. Have you heard is of that the, verse? Um, captive of war. Okay, right? so now if a Muslim attacks my place, he attacks my place right now, doing jihad, fisa bil Allah, jihad in the way of Allah. And they come and attack my, my place. And I'm married and I have my daughters. According to that verse, they can take my wife and sleep with her and even sleep with my daughters. They don't need my permission or her. Now, how many non-Muslims are going to be happy with that? That if the Muslims do have the upper hand and they attack, they have that freedom. You see, when somebody starts asking questions like this, even in Islam, they say it's like you shouldn't be fear questioning. tactics. Exactly, uh -huh. fear tactics, and the reason why is because Muhammad condemned people asking too much questions because it's in Surah Al-Maida, five one hundred one one hundred two. He tells them, "Do not ask questions because people before you ask and they lost their faith." Yeah, I heard that. Okay, so what kind of religion is this that's afraid of you to know the truth and then intimidates you not to ask questions because you lose your faith and then threatens to kill you? The you shaitan away? can come and play with your mind and make you think things. Okay, hold on. But I didn't quote shaitan. I quoted the Quran. The Quran says a Muslim man can take my married wife if he attacks my place and takes me captive and sleep with her. So how's that shaitan? That's Allah and the Quran. No, I said shaitan comes and tries to like misguide people by putting thoughts in their head like if you were to ask a question like what's the purpose or okay. who created Allah, is that or, like, could... putting in my head asking what in the world is this religion that would allow them to sleep with my wife if they took me captive that's shaitan telling me to be upset or is that god i'm saying when when you get these thoughts muslims say it's because of shaitan yeah that's i know I'm they saying. say that but why is it shaitan when this is something from shaitan, only the devil would give someone the authority to attack a person, take his wife captive and sleep with her, even though I'm still alive and she's still my wife. That is the devil. It's God who would put these thoughts in my mind to start questioning, not the devil. Okay. You get my but, point? Yes, but speaking, I just want to go back to that um, go ahead, yes. polygyny thing. And then I, I was just wondering that why would something be allowed and then most uh, Christians are still like allowed doing what? that and saying it's a legal form of marriage. Which which form of marriage? Say it again. Marrying more than one wife in no, Christianity. You like, can't do that because you say Mormons, they're Christian. Who told you they're Christians? Like saying the nation of Islam. Well, the, the, the church is literally called the Church of Jesus Christ. Yeah, okay. Well, the nation of Islam say they follow the Holy Quran. They're Muslim, but mm -hmm. they believe Allah is a black man and all black black people are gods. Are they Muslim? I think those are, that's a sect that I'm not familiar with. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm telling you what they believe. You don't need to take my word. Okay. Go to Chef Google, type in Nation of Islam. Malcolm X used to be one of them. Allah is a black man. Black people are gods. 
Yet they say they follow the Holy Quran, but they believe Elijah Muhammad is after Muhammad who sent to liberate the black people. Just because someone says they're Muslim doesn't mean they're Muslim. For example, the Church of Jesus Christ that you're quoting to me, they say that God the Father was a man on a planet, and he had a God over him. He became God, and he has a physical body, and he has a spirit wife that he has sex with and gets pregnant, gets her pregnant. You're telling me that's Christianity? That's in the Bible? Seriously? I don't know. I, I don't. I know that Mormons have their own book. Yeah, so that's my point. Just because something someone claims to be Christian doesn't mean they're Christian. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, but do Christians believe that hell is eternal? Even yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, the traditional view is that hell is eternal, but then there is a growing movement of Christians who say that if you study the languages of the Bible carefully, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, it's not eternal in duration. The destruction is eternal, meaning that God will punish you and then wipe you out of existence, and that's what makes it eternal. Your destruction is eternal. God will never reverse it. That is a debate among Christians, and it's a healthy debate you can study because similarly, believe it or not, you can ask your Muslim scholar, there are statements attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah and his pupil, Ibn Qayyim, Ibn al jawziya where they imply that the Quran teaches that hell is not eternal, that hell is for a temporary period of time. Okay. So that's a debate among Christians. And the reason why I'm careful, when there are debates among my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, Debates among my brothers, sisters, Jesus Christ, who love Jesus Christ, who love the Bible as God's perfect word, but they debate on an issue, then I don't condemn either group just because I accept one position over against another, because these are positions held by true Christian believers who worship the same God, who believe the Bible is perfect, but they have a difference of opinion how you understand these terms in their original languages. Okay. Um, one last question before yes. I go. Um, a lot of, I saw a lot of Muslims, they say things like, um, you know, don't be afraid because Allah just means God in Arabic. Even Christian Arabs say it. Okay. But then I also hear Muslims say, no, that's not what it means. It means that actually Allah is two words. It means like El the ilah. deity or the being. So, so I'm just wondering where... Where did this word come from, and yeah. how come Arab Christians say Allah as well? Yeah, okay. Now, that's a good question. Depending on what Muslim you ask, you're going to get a different answer. Mm -hmm. There are Muslims who say okay. Allah is the eternal name of the true God. He, His name is Allah even before creation. So you cannot okay. trace its origin, right? Yeah. Okay, well, from a Christian perspective, Allah is not the eternal name of God. Allah is used by Arabic-speaking Christians because that's the term in Arabic that you use when you refer to the true God, not just a God, right? A God is ilah, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they say, la ilaha. Yeah, ilah means a God. Mm -hmm. So because the term for the true God in Arabic in its definite form is Allah, you can say el ilah, but in time, Allah is simply El Ilah contracted, so Allah does the job, the true God, because you don't call a God Allah unless you believe he's the true God, right? That's in the Arabic language. If I want to speak of the true God, I don't say Ilah, I say Allah. If I'm speaking of just a God, I'll say Ilah. I only use Allah okay, for yeah. the one I think is the true God. So when the Christians use Allah, they're doing it because they believe Father, Son, Holy Spirit are the one true God. That's why Arabic-speaking Christians will call Jesus Allah in the Arabic Bible. Arabic Bible, John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with Allah. The Word was Allah. The Word was with Allah, okay. the Father, and the Word was Allah, and the Word became flesh, became man. Now, in Hebrews 1.8, let me show you what it says in the Arabic. Hebrews 1.8 says, But of the Son, he says, of the Son, Jesus the Son, the Father says to the Son, your throne, Ya Allah, is forever and ever. So the Father calls Jesus Ya Allah in the Arabic Bible. So when Arabic-speaking Christians use Allah, they mean Allah, the true God, who's the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Now, when the Muslims say Allah, do they mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit? No. Then we don't have the same Allah. 
So when you say Allah and I say Allah, we're not referring to the same Allah. It's like even in English. You say God, I say God, the Hindu says God. We all say God, but we don't have the yeah, same I God understand. in mind. So now you got the help, you got the answer. Okay. Um, that's mostly all my questions. But Call me back with more questions anytime. Thank you. Um, I, so I was just wondering if you have any degree in religion or what's no, your you know what qualifications? I am? I am like your prophet. I am an ummi. I am unlettered. So do you attend any church? Yes, I'm attending churches locally. I mean, but I, I the church I attend, you got to live in the state to go to the church I'm going to. And I don't want to give ask well, you too much of your information. Yeah, right now I'm going in, in time. I'm I'm going to return to the church of my parents, the Assyrian Church of the East. I already go there. I attend, but I want to make it official when I can take communion there. And I'm just waiting for the Lord to give me grace. So my my goal is to go back to the church of my ancestors, the Assyrian Church of the East, which is much more close to the Roman Catholic Church. The Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church than Protestant churches. That doesn't mean I won't go to Protestant churches. I still will go to Protestant churches because Trinitarian Protestants who love and worship the Triune God and believe the Bible is God's perfect work are my brothers and sisters, and I still will fellowship and serve them. But my my the way I'm going, I'm going back to the church of my my parents because that church very similar. There are some differences, but they're minor, with the Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, Coptic Church. And the Catholic Church allows the Assyrian Church of the East to take communion in their church. So that's my goal. That's what I'm headed. But you're not Assyrian. You don't speak Aramaic. The Assyrian Church is not for you, unless you want to learn Assyrian, the language of heaven. Okay. Um, so with all these, you know, different churches, then what... According to Christianity, what is the proper way to worship God then? Well, uh, you're asking me a beautiful question. I don't know how to answer that for you because, number one, I don't know. I know you said you're Albanian. I don't know where you're at, where you're located, so what church I'd re recommend for you. Now, how do they worship? Well, early on, historically, and this is why you see Muslims worshiping similarly, when Muslims pray five times a day and they recite the Quran in Arabic, because Muhammad was modeling his form of worship in light of the churches at that time, because the churches at that time, they too would pray several times a day, and they too would chant their prayers, quoting Bible verses. So the way Muslims worship was modeled after how Christians were worshiping at that time, because early on, at least from the second century onwards, they would gather and they would recite verses of the Bible in their chanting as they chanted prayers to God as an act of worship around the Eucharist. And so what you find in Islam, this is why Muslims don't understand when they say, well, look, Muslims memorize the Quran. Let me tell you why you're able to memorize the Quran. Because the, the Quran is, is put to what we call rote. In other words, it's almost like a song, but not a song. And when yeah. and you and I both know that our brain has been created and designed by God to be able to recite and take in and recall songs much more than simply reading a book, right? But in Christianity, is music allowed? Yes. In fact, the churches surrounding Muhammad, and even now, like the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Assyrian the Church, God, and the Coptic, the Coptic Church. The, yeah, the Coptic the Lutheran churches, they recite their prayers, they chant their prayers, it's liturgical worship, and that's where Muhammad got the idea of how to design his form of worship in light of these traditions. I thought that was Sufi. Sufi. No, when you recite the Quran in the five daily prayers, when you go and say, I don't, you know, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and you recite the surahs, right? I'm talking about uh, songs to worship God, like singing. Yeah. You don't call it song, but um, let me be honest with you. When we hear the Quran chanted, that's music. You won't call it that because it's haram. But for someone who's well, not... Music would be mus musical instruments, no. not a voice. Have you ever sang without musical instruments? Here, I'll sing a song to you. It's now or never, come on me tight. Okay, am I singing? Yes, but it's, that's Where's not music, that's a cappella. Okay, even better, but you, you, won't, say, you won't say I'm, I'm, I'm chanting a song? 
Are we going to get technical here? So back then, the time of Muhammad, they had the word a cappella. Hey, that's not singing, Muhammad. That's a cappella. No, a cappella just means when you sing with no music. Okay, but it's singing. That's my point. A cappella is a form of singing. That's the point. I mean music. It's a form of music. You're saying it's music. Singing, but it's not. Music song, is instrument. chanting, reciting. A lot of snack bar, a lot of snack bar. Anyway, we're going to have to agree to disagree. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying the proper way to worship God is in congregation? Of course. Congregational worship is very important according to the scripture because Jesus came to, to found a church. And men and women mix together. Yeah. I mean, well, when you say mix, historically, even among Christians, at the time mm -hmm. Muhammad, before Muhammad, even now, you didn't have the free mixing of men and women. There was some type of structure. Couples would be together, but young men and one, one young woman would be separate, but worship side by side, separately. Not the woman in the back like you Muslims do, where you have the woman okay. in the back in a curtain. But there is decorum. There is respect. Well, they say that in the time of the messenger, um, there was no curtain. Good. That so why did you, you, you introduce the curtain? Stuck for Allah, but the woman was still behind, right? I don't know. There, actually, that's a big debate at many malls if there should be a curtain or no curtain. But that's at the, the time, Muhammad, thing. when they didn't have the curtain, the women were behind the men still. Yeah. Okay. I Can I ask know. you a question, though? I don't know. Okay, but if that's true, find out. And if it's true, just ask some questions. Say, I know I? it's true that they didn't have a curtain. That's why many Muslims today, they say we don't need it. Yeah, but they didn't pray side by side with men. Women were behind no. the men, right? Yeah, they were in the back. Okay, so here's my question. Why is it okay for women to be behind men and see them bow down and see their buttocks, but men can't do that for women? Why this racism and chauvinism? I don't know. You, see that, you, you understand what I asked you? I want you? They're mixed. No, but wait, hold on. It's okay for the woman to look at a man, bend down with his buttocks and facing the ceiling, but it's not okay for a woman to be in front of the man. So, the, so women can be tempted, that's okay. But if men are tempted, that's haram. Haram alayk. Why the discrimination? Stuck for Allah. Well, when you're praying, you're supposed to look down. That's the thing. Yeah, but come on. You know not everyone's going to go down at the same time. The man goes down. Oops, there is his, there is tight jeans and his butt sticking up to the ceiling. Come on, sister. Come. Well, they say when the man should pray, he has his awra, which are the things that... Um, but you, your, entire, your voice is an awra. So why are you talking to me? You know in Islam, your voice is an awra? Well, it they they say talking normally is not awra because they said once um, Musa he was on a journey and he asked these women for directions and they spoke to him normally. Oh, but that's an exception to the norm, and he's a prophet. I don't know if it's an exception or not. Okay. I, I'm not gonna say. How I'm many Muslims that. say even your voice is awra? I know I'm not saying you Muslims. You get I know there are. They say, uh -huh. but but even that's my point. But some they say if you're talking normally, it's not. Okay, even if you talk normally, aren't there Muslim men? I'm not saying all, because in Islam, you have two Muslims with the opinions. Even speaking normally to someone who's not a Muharram, that's an Mah aura. Mahram. Yeah, and I call it Muharram because I like that Muharram is better. Muharram because I can make it rhyme. Say it again. Mahram? Yeah, Mahram. But can we say Muharram? Is that okay we say Muharram? I don't, I don't, I don't know. But I like Muharram. But okay, we'll say it the way you said it, mahram, mahram. That's how you like to say it, right? Okay. okay, mahram. Even you speaking to someone who's not a mahram, is that lawful? I don't know. I'm no? just saying I'm not a scholar. Good, that's just, Anyway, that's, that's yeah, irrelevant. My I don't want to talk about Islam. My understanding was that it's okay to talk to the Yeah, I don't want to talk about Islam because I don't want to discourage you from calling in and asking me. But uh, yeah, and don't tell any Muslims that you're calling and asking me. Keep it a secret, all right? You don't have to lie. I'm not saying lie, but you don't have to tell everyone your, what your business is, right? Things you can keep for yourself between you and Allah. Right? No, I don't. Okay. Um, I don't want you well, to get in trouble. You. I'm saying it for your sake. Thank you. Um, I don't want to take your time too much. Okay, and if you have more questions, that's you're not basically my, my time. questions. The most thing I wanted to know about was just the, um, the concept of heaven and hell in Christianity. Yes. And Basically, why there's so many denominations, and that's it. That's yeah, all I not, need to ask. Finally, I want you to think about the difference between heaven and hell in Islam Christianity. In heaven, there is no sex. Mm -hmm. We don't have sex. 
in heaven, we will have glorified bodies that never die. And we're going to be in the presence of God, seeing God visibly, being filled with his love and joy forever, but no more sex. Your Jannah, according to your Quran mm -hmm. and Sunnah, you're going to have the hoodies with swelling breasts, big breasts that don't sag, and men with eternal erections deflowering them forever and ever, along with young boys serving them, meats, wine, milk, and water, you name it. Now, are you okay? I want to ask you honestly. Are you okay that you and your mother, if you make it to Islamic Jannah, will be among the hoodies for a man to deflower forever and ever? I don't want to answer this kind of question. That's all right. I just want you to think about it. And it's not the shaitan with the waswas. It is God Almighty, the true God, the true God who loves you with an everlasting love, Father, His Son, Jesus, Holy Spirit, who loves you and adores you, speaking in your ears to set you free from shaitan and his lies, because the greatest disrespect for a woman is to say that Jannah will be a place where there'll be Huris and some of the Muslimah who are good enough Muslimah to make it, joining them on couches for Muslim men with eternal erections, deflowering them, and they go back to being virgins and being deflowered over and over again with swelling breasts, breasts that are big, that don't sag. That's chapter 78 of the Quran, verse 33. What a filthy, okay, wicked and, and back to what I said about shaitan putting things. Um, I was just saying that what Muslims say yes. when somebody, they, for example, were to ask questions that they would say that are leading to disbelief, which amen. is what I said before. No, I know they're saying that. And I'm praying that the true God will reveal to you he is speaking to your heart because he loves you and bring you to the truth. And Jesus Christ is Lord. So anytime you have questions, call me. I'll answer. I'm here for you. Okay, wait, I just thought one more thing. Sure, go ahead. A lot of Christians say that um, a, a Christian could not go to hell because they say that they're, um, what's the word, that Jesus basically purchased the sin. Yeah, well, I'm just wondering, then, what's the point of earth in Christianity then? What do you mean, what's the point? If Jesus is coming to like, the earth. He's coming to the earth to dwell. But what's with the point of human beings if they say that you're, if Jesus already died for your sins? I don't know what's. What's your question? It doesn't. Like they say, if Jesus died for your sins and you're forgiven, then what's the point of the earth, of, of, of being on earth for humans? Because that's where we're going to live forever with Jesus on earth. So in Islam, it says that the dunya is a punishment for the believers yeah. and that our place is in heaven. Yeah. So then do Christians believe that this earth is a punishment as well? No, the earth was created for God and man to dwell together. But when Adam and Eve sinned, then the earth became corrupt and now God's goal is to then restore the earth and make it perfect and pure so that those who believed in Jesus who are now resurrected and are glorified with bodies that can never die and where they'll never sin will dwell with God on earth forever. It's not heaven out there. Heaven's coming to the earth at the end when Jesus comes to resurrect the living and the dead. Punish the wicked, banish them from the earth, change the earth to become perfect. No more pain, no more suffering, no more disease, no more death. And believers dwell with God on earth forever. That's Revelation chapter 21, 22. So we don't believe like you, the dunya is simply a punishment. And then the dunya will be wiped out and you're going to leave in Jannah. Jannah will be on earth and God will be on earth with human beings forever. Okay. And then one... Just wanted to know if there's a punishment for leaving Christianity. Not on this earth. As Christians, we have no right to do anything to you. As a Christian who loves Jesus, I have no right to kill you or throw you in prison because Jesus didn't give me that authority. All your punishment would be is you can't come to church and have fellowship with us and take the Eucharist until you repent and return to Jesus. But apart from that, you can do what you want. You're going to answer to God on the day of judgment. Okay. Okay. That's all I need to ask. Anytime. May the Lord Thank Jesus you. bless you. May the Lord Jesus keep you sweet. And may he make you his angel, glorifying him, and that you're in love with him as he's in love with you. Lord Jesus, save her and bring her and use her as your light in Jesus' name. So anytime you have a question, call me. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. What a sweet angel, man. Pray for her. What a sweet angel. 
She, you know why she made me smile, guys? Because she sounds like she's young enough to be my daughter, a young, you know, and it's just like angelic. May the Lord Jesus save her in Jesus' name. And she's so intelligent. Pray for her. God knows her by name. I don't want to give out too much information about her. Just say, Lord Jesus, that Albanian Muslima. Right? All right. 